Welcome to 99's The 13th Floor Review and Thoughts film. I realize this video is long, but if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is fairly comparatively short, at least that's the idea. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler, so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. But as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And go. So, in the year 1999, something mysterious is going on with the people working on a high-quality simulation of an American town in 1937. And we see the 1937 simulation. It's very classy with jazz music playing. There's singing and dancing appropriate to the period and the you know color grading which amusingly is you know the the in the film itself they they realize that 1937 the color is a little off but really it's color graded to look like something from back then the they're getting close to being able to test the program it's been six years of programming they just got done with the crunch, they're laying a bunch of hardworking people off, and despite all the delays in the release, there are still a lot of bugs to deal with. Honestly, if you pre-ordered, you got screwed. Now, if this movie is something you've never heard of, it is a mystery sci-fi thriller from 1999, directed by Joseph Rusnak, who... You know, you might not know who he is, but it was made in part... You know, it was produced by Roland Emmerich. And before you... I, I know, I know. The man has made very few good movies. But this movie is a lot better than the ones he tends to make. And... So yeah, the concept of the film. It's basically a film noir complete with an opening with mysterious narration, very foreboding. Murder mystery with the wrong man accused, femme fatale exploring a realistic simulation of the world. Some people feel that the film focuses too much on the noir aspect, too little on the sci-fi element. I can understand what they mean, but I do feel that it worked well for the movie. I don't think the movie would have been as strong if it focused entirely on the sci-fi aspect. Honestly, I could imagine that some people who love noir could watch this movie and enjoy it even if they don't normally like sci-fi. And the movie is definitely in love with the simulation of 1937, which bothered some viewers who felt they spent too much time on it. And, you know, they, they felt like there's a lot of ego stroking. I don't think that it's the filmmakers feeling that they just did such an incredible job recreating 1937. I think it's reflecting the characters in the film, their elation at seeing how good it is. You know, they spent six years making it and... But again, it might really bother you if that's not your kind of thing. And just, yeah, some people really hated it. So if that, if you think that might be you, maybe don't watch it. I, it, yeah. And, yeah. So I'm aware that some people feel that you have to choose one of the, yeah, one of the following moves that you can't love all the, what you might call Y2K extremely realistic simulation movies. And yeah, there's really no way I'm going to be able to discuss. Hmm. I guess technically, I can't even say what I'm going to. Excuse me. Without spoiling. Okay, so, huh, yeah, I should have thought of that before I started recording. I guess, okay, yeah, by now, most people know, but okay, so I'm going to be spoiling various movies, including The Matrix, Existence, yeah, those, those two movies, not, not The Thirteenth Floor. But the Matrix and Existence. So yeah, personally, I love all three of these. This, you know, the Thirteenth Floor doesn't go in the exact same direction as those movies, and it's not intended to. And 
for some reason, a lot of people said that the 13th floor is a ripoff of The Matrix. It came out so soon after that the ma of then so soon at, so soon after the Matrix, they couldn't possibly have done the entire thing between when the Matrix came out and when this came out. It was like it was a few months or something, maybe six months. The you know, and the Matrix being about simulation was a plot twist in that movie. The trailers made it out to be a great mystery, it did not give away that it was about simulation. I don't know. I guess it's possible that like producers heard that the matrix was being made about simulation and so they made sure that this movie would come out close to it but they're really not the same thing they are they are hugely different in a lot of ways again i love both of them all three of these movies had very similar ideas around the same time because when a millennium comes to a close it makes us question very deep things makes us think about you know, the, yeah, in, in the, um, I, f I forget exactly when it was, I, I don't remember if it was, well, let's see, well, yeah, actually, I guess, I guess it must have been in the year 1999. I think what it was back then, I should have looked it up, but I think what it was was that people were thinking maybe the world will end soon, and in... 1999, you know, in addition to the Y2K bug, which, as far as I know, never came to that. It was just, people were freaking out. People were thinking there's going to be a big change. There's going to be something huge. And one thing that several, you know, people making movies thought of was, what if the world is just a simulation? And... Yeah, so several movies were made around the, you know, right around 1999. That doesn't mean that they were ripping off each other. And let's see. Right, that was it for the spoilers for those movies. The first time you watch this movie, try not to guess where it's going because you might be able to, and that will take a lot of enjoyment out of the experience. That's also why I'm being so vague in my plot description compared to some of the other recent reviews I've done. And yeah, I really appreciate that this movie goes into some of the ethical issues of realistic simulation in a way I haven't seen other movies do. It's possible that those movies exist and I just don't know about them. I will say I have seen it covered and well on Star Trek on the in some of those shows, but I don't know any other movie that does this good a job of Anyway, and uh, I get why some people feel that opening the movie with a Descartes quote is pretentious, and I'm not sure I can really argue against it. All I can say is I feel that the movie does enough things right that the things it does wrong don't ruin the experience, but I can understand. Yeah, for some people it might sour it. I don't know, I guess, okay, when the when you start the movie, just close your eyes for the first few seconds, I think it's right at the very start, and then open them, and just pretend that you didn't hear me say that there was a Descartes quote there. And I'm not even going to tell you which Descartes quote it is, because there's you, you already know what. It's, it's too obvious to not use, for, for it not to be that specific one. Anyway, this was written by Joseph Rusnak, who also directed, and Ravel Centeno Rodriguez. I, I probably got at least some of that pronunciation wrong, sorry. I don't know anything else that they've written. Now, I would say, you know, the there are other movies that do more with the concept of an extremely realistic simulation, but I... I love this one, and it does do some things that those other movies don't do. And I would say the writers did a pretty good job on making what they, you know, the moment that you have this concept, an extremely realistic simulation of what the world looked like in the past. There are a lot of interesting things you can do with that, and yeah, you know, I... I recommend all of these. I think all of them, all of them do something that the others don't do. 
and I would say there are enough differences and enough strong qualities in all of them that all of them are worth watching. Now the movie handles plot twists pretty well. I think it's the right amount. I don't think it's too few or too many. Some say that it's too many, but and and certainly I will grant that the reveal I mean there's not much I can say without spoiling spoiling this movie until I lower my index finger again the the reveal of the final twist comes at a bit mm, Let me keep it vague and say it's either too early in the film or too late in the film. No more spoilers for the time being. And ultimately I can only speak for myself. And, you know, I can recount from, you know, I've, I've shown this movie to th three or four people. And all of them... And, you know, myself, we were able to follow it on the first viewing. And I, I wasn't, like, feeding them clues. They picked up on everything that they needed to, and they followed it. I am aware that some people weren't able to follow it. Some, some people watched the entire thing and, like, read on Wikipedia, and they still couldn't quite, you know, I... So, so it is a thing. Some people didn't feel that it was enough. And let's see. The direction is fairly focused. And again, I don't really know Joseph Rusnak from anything else, but it does look like he's directed some fun, wild horror movies. One of them, a woman has just given birth, but it was to this mutant baby that eats people when it gets scared. And that's just awesome. I might actually find try to find a copy of that and and just that's I kind of love that, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so... It has a very strong opening, this movie. I'm not going to give away exactly what you see, but you're immediately... There, there are immediately some questions, and some of the answers to the questions come not very long after. The movie starts but some of them it's gonna be a bit of the movie and you're sitting there you're trying to figure out which ones again try try not to try too hard to figure it out because you might be able to and it's not gonna be as compelling a viewing experience but yeah it, it hooks you pretty well it's yeah and it, it is a very film noir opening and the ending does a good job resolving all the stuff that's been set up. Some people find it to be anticlimactic and unsatisfying. It maybe ends on a note. I'm, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending. But the way it ends is something that a lot of people didn't want. It, they, they didn't want that kind of ending. I don't love the ending, but it doesn't ruin the movie for me. I'm not saying you're wrong if it did for you. For me, so much good stuff is in the movie leading up to it that, yeah, the, the very ending, but, but it does resolve everything. It doesn't really end it, almost everything. I guess there's perhaps one or two things. And it is, in some ways, it is very appropriate to what it's come for. Now, as for whether you lose interest along the way, in my experience, you know, I haven't, and the four people I've shown it to haven't, some people did lose interest. And it is, if you don't find the hook interesting enough, and if you, you know, if you really don't like seeing the 1937 world, if you, if you, if you want a straight science fiction movie, this is not for you. This movie works especially well for people who both love film noir and sci-fi, and I'm one of those people. And, yeah, you know, if, if you are not, this is not f for you, you know. There, there are other, yeah, 
there are other movies that have very similar things that aren't. So, yeah. I don't know how this fares in, as an adaptation. I have not read the original 1964 book, which is typically known as Simulacron-3, but it also has the way more awesome title of The Counterfeit World. I agree with the, the, there are some people who say that the the 13th floor has very little to do with it. It has it doesn't have nothing to do with it, but it's not necessary. They they didn't have to call it the 13th floor. I think the counterfeit world might have been a really awesome title. That might have grabbed more people. You know, some people say the reason this didn't hit again, there's a reason you might not have heard of this movie before. And one of those reasons is what is the, what, 13th floor, what does that mean? Like, even Friday the 13th, even if you've never watched one of those movies, you know that Friday the 13th, okay, that signifies something bad, that something bad will happen there. But the 13th floor, I mean, literally, the, the only thing that immediately comes to mind, if you don't know this movie, obviously if you know this movie, that's something that comes to mind. But if you don't, I mean, okay, usually elevators don't have a 13th floor because we're really superstitious. But that's, a, that's basically it, and I mean, technically, this movie has an elevator that goes to the 13th floor, and I don't know, maybe they just really loved, you know, the tagline is, you can go there even though it doesn't exist. And obviously for that, you need something like the 13th floor to be, you know, if, if this movie was called The Counterfeit World, and the tagline was, you can go there even though it doesn't exist, okay, technically, it still kind of works, but... Yeah, I, I think they maybe just fell in love with that tagline, and so they made the movie, they, they titled the movie that. And I guess to a certain extent, like, some mystery about it is effective, but ultimately it was too vague. They, they should have found a title that really tells you, you know, like, on Star Trek The Next Generation, they don't call it the 13th floor, they call it the hollow deck. That immediately said, oh, okay, so there's, so it's a deck that has holograms. Now you know what the, you know, and yeah, I mean, if this was called, let's see, the holographic world, you know, holographic 1937 something, maybe more people would have watched it and, I am aware that a number of the people who did watch it didn't, like, and I, I can totally understand, like, if you thought this would go more in the direction of some of the other, let's see, if I mention them again, I have to spoil again, but some of the other movies that came out around 1999 that dealt with very realistic simulations of the real world, I can understand why you might feel like this is the, the least impressive of them. I just don't feel that way. And I don't. I, th I think it's very necessary to look at what is it actually trying to do. And a big thing is is noir and this sort of. Hmm. Is that a spoiler? The yeah, the noir murder mystery is a huge part of it, and then this simulation is you know this very impressive thing. And, you know, maybe not impressive by, like, effect standards, but if you imagined in 1999 having this realistic a simulation of 1937 American Town, yeah, it is very impressive. And I kind of feel like you, you kind of have to sit and watch a movie like this and just be like, what are the characters feeling? Are the characters impressed by this? Because then maybe I am too, but if they're, you know, if they're not... But yeah, you know, this is not quite, it's not what some people may have expected. And the fact that it came out after some of the, at least one of the other movies, yeah, maybe some people did feel like, well, you can't, you know, after, uh, let me think, when The Thing came out in 1982, the movie E.T. had come out, and basically people wanted cute aliens now. They didn't want scary aliens, and the thing just really, it wasn't what people wanted at the time, and because of that, it didn't do that well at first. Also, 
part of it is because it was directed by I can't believe I'm playing on his name. He's one of my favorite directors. One second. I, I have it right on the tip of my tongue. John Carpenter. And that guy has some kind of hex curse on him because like every movie he's ever directed was ahead of its time. And like years later, people were like, that was actually really good. Even though when it came out, they're like, I just don't get it. And and that's just anyway. But no, the the I can understand why some people felt that this didn't live up to their now changed expectations but i don't really think it's fair and i don't think the people making those other movies would think it was fair either i i i don't know for sure i haven't i haven't heard if they've been asked i haven't heard their answer if they've been asked but i don't think so i don't think that they're that they were trying to ruin things for movies like this anyway i'm also aware there was an old miniseries that was adapted you know uh, miniseries in 1973 which was also an adaptation of the book. I haven't watched the miniseries either. And so let's see the yeah, so I've heard different people pronouncing his name differently. I haven't really been able to get confirmation. I think you pronounce it Craig Bierko, so that's how I'm gonna pronounce it. Craig Bierko plays Douglas Hall. He's not a hugely interesting character, but he makes for a good audience insert character. He is our window into the world. At the very start of the movie, he's never entered the simulation of 1937, but he may have to now in order to solve the mystery. And yeah, you know, he's he, there's a little bit of a blank slate thing going on with him, and he's as confused by the, the mystery as we are. I, I feel like it works for the movie. I don't think not every movie ever made needs to have an incredibly compelling main character. I think it can be a really good thing, but they don't all need those. That. And Gretchen Maul plays Jane Fuller, and she comes to Douglas when her father dies, and she's mysterious, and the two of them maybe start falling in love with each other. As soon as we see her, the very first thing the camera and acting highlight that Douglas is attracted to her, and I I get the sense that she's also attracted to him, but she's maybe playing it a little more cool. Like he, he's practically got googly eyes. He's not good at hiding it. Maybe that's intentional. I don't know. But she, she plays it a little more cool, but you get the sense that there is something. But, yeah, she's the daughter of the character played by Armin Mueller Stahl, Hannon Fuller, who he he basically he is the the boss. He 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 basically had the most input on how the simulation was going to come out. And the <clears throat> yeah, he he discovered something and he's now dead and now Jan John and Jane have to figure out what it was he discovered and yeah he dies very early in the film and several of the main and supporting characters are introduced grieving him so we really get a sense that he was important to them and the you know again part of it is that you as an audience excuse me <coughs> you as an audience are sitting there and you're like Wow, these people really, really miss this guy. So he must be really important. He must be a really big deal. And as such, you know, without the movie, like, like there's not, there's not like a, a news story where we're told all of his amazing achievements. You know, some some of the people say, some of the characters say some really, you know, really, really praise him, but. It, it is this thing of we, you know, we, we care about his death, even though we didn't know him when he died, because they care. And, yeah, I mean, it's not a, it's not a surprise to say that Vincent D'Onofrio steals the show, but, yeah, 
he plays Jerry, uh, sorry, Jason Whitney, there we go, who, you know, he helped create the simulation and knows how to run it, and you can tell he's really passionate about the simulation from the way he talks about it. The, yeah, he, he is incredibly excited about the, the simulation and how, yeah, so the, let's see, yeah. And Dennis Haysbert plays Detective Larry McBain, and he's investigating the murder of Fuller. And that is basically everyone. Yeah. Some of the actors... Actually, yeah, before I start... The simulation, some of the people in the simulation were based upon the appearance of people working on it. So Whitney, Douglas, and Hannon all have someone in the simulation that looks like them, but their personality might be very different. So yeah, you know, these three actors have to play simulated and real versions with very different personalities, and they do incredible at it. Like, if I've never actually tried to do this, but I'll bet that if, I mean, I guess if you don't care about the movie, but hypothetically, if you're one of the viewers who cares about the movie, if you watch this and then several years pass before you watch it again, and you see just a short clip out of context that you don't remember from when in the movie it is, and you don't know which, if, if it's the real character or the simulation character, you're still going to be able to tell because the just everything like the way they carry themselves the body language the way they talk the things they say everything is completely different and it is yeah it's it's incredibly convincing and yeah now as far as chemistry goes i feel like when we see Douglas and Whitney have decent chemistry with each other. You believe that they've worked, you know, I mean, in reality, these are actors. They, you know, they, they spent maybe a few months shooting this movie. But in, in the fiction, we're supposed to believe they've been working together for six years. And, yeah, I, I feel like they, they come across as, like, you know, at least once one of them guesses what the, you know, like, Maybe it's not a hugely difficult thing to guess, but they kind of, they see where the other one is going. And, you know, they, they, and they don't really want the other person to go and do that thing. And so they, you know, their passion at trying to talk them out of it is palpable. It feels like they're trying to talk a friend they've known for six years out of doing something they think they'll regret. More than just, you know, these are two actors reciting lines that they didn't write, you know. I will say, I don't know that Douglas and Jane have that strong chemistry. You know, I... Some people really don't like the love story, and it is... Yeah, I'll, I'll get a little bit more into it very soon. Now, some of the performances are fairly low-key, except some of Vincent and Alfred's acting. And... I've seen at least one reviewer say that every line is spoken as if it's extremely important. So that that kind of sounds to me like it's more an issue of direction than acting talent. Because, you know, several of the these... I've seen all of these actors in something else. And they're really talented elsewhere. So even if they're not that great in this, you know, the director is maybe a little more... He's good with effects, but not necessarily directing actors. Now, let's see. The, yeah, and so the dialogue at times can be kind of cliched and bland. Like, Hollywood dialogue that doesn't sound like anyone talks in real life. I'm not saying the movies have to sound like real life, but just beware. It's a thing in this movie, and there are a few monologues that are kind of like... Yeah, 
you know, monologues, they, they can be very difficult to make, come, you know, make it sound natural. And the love story stuff can especially be kind of obnoxious. If, if it's the kind of thing that might bother you, then yeah, this movie, you know, it, it might really bother you. Even though the actors play it pretty well. And as far as dialogue, there's also some wit. But yeah, the love story... I'm not usually a big fan of love stories. I feel like... To me, a love story has to be in service of something else. You know, and whether that's some funny comedy, whether it's... You know, the the plot. You know, but it kind of has to be in service of something. And in this movie it is. And yeah, it's a it's a decent enough love story. But uh, yeah, I, I, if there's one thing, like if you don't... If film noir is something that isn't really your kind of thing, then you're probably not going to like this movie. That's... The, the people I showed it to, the ones who liked it the most, are the ones who like noir movies. At least one of them didn't really care that much about noir. He still liked it, but he didn't... Like, the ones who were like, you know, oh yeah, it's just like, you know, this and that noir movie. They, they were way more stoked on the movie, and that is something, like... I've read some people really criticize this, and I'm not saying that's the only... Like, if you don't like it, that's fine. But some people don't like it because they didn't real they didn't think it was going to be so it it was going to there was going to be this much film noir in it and sometimes the delivery of the dialogue can be overly dramatic now let's see the so yeah the cinematography the the dp really understood how to make this work and you know, there are some really visual some really impressive shots in this shots that really get across the scope of the simulation and the the way it uses light and shadow can at times be very film noir and as others have pointed out the movie is strong from a technical standpoint but perhaps doesn't do as well with story or emotions whether yours or the characters And let's see. Yeah, and some some of the some of the editing, they they do these neat things with like parallels and and kind of like they'll they'll Yeah, see I can't possibly give any of it away without really spoiling something major, but there, there are a couple of things where the movies will draw parallels between two or more things, and yeah, it does a really good job at conveying a, you know, a, a metaphor. And some of the simulation is accomplished with 3D CG animation, and they understood that it was limited, they don't depend too much on it. I've seen some still criticize the I don't know, I, I feel like they, they did a perfectly decent job. I will say, it was a little amusing, something I definitely noticed was that this movie and the first X-Men movie, you know, there's this part where the camera basically traveled, there's like this swirl of a lot of, like, ah, yeah, see, I'm not sure I can really explain. You'll know when you see it if you watch both movies. And... Yeah, some of the... There's also some, some digital compositing, which is... If you don't look... Like, like the, the DVD comes with these stills of pre and post digital compositing and I had forgotten once again it's been some years uh, actually I didn't say that it has been several years since the last time I watched this movie and back then I also looked at it because I look at DVD extras pretty much always but 
when yeah I, I'd forgotten just how much of it they actually do with compositing and if you don't look at the DVD you know look at the the stills from before and after digital compositing you're not gonna know like you can I pretty much defy you to spot at least most of these compositing shots if you don't know that you know it's, it's exactly when they are and I would say there's an appropriate amount of effects like enough to sell you on the simulation concept and they knew that it wouldn't hold up to scrutiny so they had to hide it or yeah so they, they wisely hide it I've seen some people like when the when a person goes into the simulation there are these green lasers that run just over their body when they're lying in the you know to, to go into the simulation and some people have this I'm gonna call it irrational hatred of this I don't know why but I guess okay yeah if if you think you might be one of the people who despise that aspect then don't watch the movie because it's really gonna fall on you based on some other people but I mean I don't know if they did they think that we're supposed to think that the ah, what's the word that the movie itself like that the I mean the movie isn't saying that because there are lasers over the over you know the top of their body that that's somehow gonna like that's not that's not the idea it's just I honestly it's probably to to make it to make it a little more more visual because it is literally just you know you, li you lie down in a specific place and pre you know keyboard you know yeah keyboard clacking for a little bit and then that's it and they wanted to make it a little more visual but the movie isn't saying that the green lasers running across your face somehow you know over the top of your your face and body somehow like put you inside the simulation you know that's that's not the idea it's just a visual thing you know they they thought it would look good and i think it looks fine you know i, I don't know why some people hate it so much there are not a huge amount of stunts but the ones the, that there are are very impressive and the production design do a great job of bringing 1937 America to life in the simulation and you know we see a hotel a bank we see the the place where they built the simulation we, we get a pretty good sense of, of both the simulation and the reality of the world and yeah it is you know the the they they do both get this the the film noir aspect across very nicely you know the 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 main thing is set in 1999 I'm pretty sure it's L A and basically the and what should say oh that's right. Yeah, so I already talked a little bit about the, the 13th floor, the, the title and the tagline. So, yeah, I'm just going to read a little bit of the blurb here. To find the answers, Doug has to go into his computer city. He must break the boundary between reality and fiction. He must go to the 13th floor. But yeah, I'm pretty sure it's LA. And it's, you know, it's got this kind of rainy, you know, you've got some, like, Jane stays at a pretty fancy hotel and like she has a driver so you know it has this kind of fancy thing going on and we do also see some more lower class areas and yeah the the movie it's not an action movie, but there are a few scenes that basically do qualify as action scenes. You know, it, it is primarily a mystery, but there is a sense of threat and there are some scenes of danger. 
and they do a good job on it. It does legitimately feel, you know, it doesn't live up to some of the other movies with some of the similar ideas, but yeah. And yeah, some, some really great tension and suspense, some really disturbing material. I'm not going to give away who the villain might be, but I will say they are very memorable. And their relationship with the protagonist is fun. And let's see. Yeah, and the scenes are easy to follow, and they are meant to, and I think that was the right way to handle it. There's enough mystery that you shouldn't have trouble following the scenes. It does work for some movies. There are some really great movies where the the fact that you have to really work hard to keep, you know, like David Lynch, for example, makes a lot, you know, there's a lot where you have to really pay close attention to follow it. It works for him. I don't think it will work for this movie. Now, the music is by, I'm pretty sure he's German, so I guess it's Harald Klose. And, yeah, so let's see, he, the other stuff I've seen him do music for is 2012, 10,000 BC, Alien vs. Predator, and The Day After Tomorrow. I know, I know, you can just start the intervention now. I know I watch some really crappy movies sometimes, but yeah, I would say this is my favorite of his scores. I do think there's some good music in some of these other movies, but yeah. I, f I feel he, it works well to, like, the, the tension and suspense, it, it works really well for Some of that is also the audio editing beyond the, the score itself. And the, the camera work and the, the video editing also, yeah. Once again, it's, it's effective from a technical perspective. Now, the... Let's see. Yeah. And I would say it's, yeah, it's a very compelling mystery and you, makes you think. And yeah, some people have said that, you know, the, the movie is somewhat low key and not like very big. In, in like tone and atmosphere, some some have said it's it's somewhat similar to Gattaca in that regard, and I agree. And yeah, I think if you like Gattaca, you might also like the Thirteenth Floor, and vice versa. And let's see. Now there is some violence and and blood. It's not. It's not a huge amount, and the, like, sexual material is also, there's, there's only a little, and it's, it's very mild. Yeah, the, the violence, I guess, would qualify as moderate, maybe even strong. And, yeah, I would say there's not too much violence and sex. It's appropriate, it serves a purpose. And I, you know, at times it can be cathartic. I'm not sure I would say that it's ever fun. You know, it, it, usually when there's violence in this movie, when there's violence in this movie, it's in a threatening, you know, there's a sense of danger. It's in a threatening manner. It is you know, scary and and intense. And I think that works really well for the movie. This is not a movie where the protagonist, you know, gets... Um, yes, let's see, that's... It, almost always, when, when someone wields... No, the, yeah, the violence in this, it is dangerous and scary and threatening. And... Obviously, not all movies. Some some of my favorite movies have handled the violence in a, in a different way, but I think it works extremely well for this movie that that's the way they handle it. 
I forget if I already mentioned, but yeah, sometimes, yeah. Yeah, just in case. Sometimes the, the violence can be cathartic. And... Yeah, you know, the, the movie monster... Yeah, in some movies it makes the most sense for the violence to be unpleasant for the viewer. The movie Monster accomplishes this well. We don't enjoy the violence, we just want it to stop. And I would say this movie goes for that, and I would say it accomplishes it. And yeah, ultimately if you need more detail about the, the violence and sexuality in this movie, the IMDb Parents Guide has more detail. At times, this can be a little cheesy, but yeah, overall the tone is somewhat subdued. The level of realism is fairly high. I mean, really, the main thing that some people will find to be hard to believe is that in 1999, such a convincing simulation of reality would be possible with that era's technology. But beyond that, you know, the laws of physics apply, the just, you know, thin, whether, like, the, the movie doesn't tend to have ridiculous, like, coincidences in order to make things work out. <clears throat> like, over the course of the movie, there might be some things where early on you kind of question why did that happen that way. I would say by the end of the movie when you think back to early in the movie, everything basically holds up. You know, it basically made sense. Like, there's maybe a little bit of, little bit of convenience, but by and large, it, it, uh, yeah. So yeah, the, the simulation part, you do need to suspend disbelief to enjoy the movie, but otherwise, not really. And, yeah, so the pacing, I mean, overall, I would say it does, you know, over the course of the movie, it does speed up. Things become more tense and intense. The, the sort of, the sources of danger become more threatening. And, yeah, the, the movie is never slow or boring. At the start of it, it's not incredibly fast-paced. And I guess, I mean, technically, it's it's not necessarily fast-paced for a sci-fi movie, but for a film noir, it is, you know, it's not Sin City, but it is, you know, yeah, I mean, classic noir does often move fairly fast. There's a lot, you know, a, a lot can happen in a single noir movie. Now, the movie is an hour and 36 and a half minutes long, if you have the end credits. I would say it's worth the investment of time. If, by, if, if you watch th the first 30 minutes and you're not hooked by then, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. Now, yeah, so I, I haven't watched the old miniseries or read the book. I did read Wikipedia about both of them. There are a number of similarities, and I it does really seem like when they made this movie, they understood how, you know, how to best, you know, they, they understood what was the most interesting thing about the source material and how to best get that across in this, and... Yeah, and in some ways, this is a fairly unique movie. I, I'm not sure I know that many sci-fi movies that are also noir. And, let's see. Yeah, some of the sexual stuff in this might bother some of the more conservative audiences. Otherwise, I'm not sure I would say this is really going to offend many people. Well, actually, uh, I guess, yeah, some some of the ethical issues of the, the simulation thing 
it's like like I said, it's legitimately disturbing to think about, and is perhaps, yeah, you know, if you if you think it might upset you, I'm not sure I would say to take the risk. I and mean, maybe just you know, it personally, it's something that I've always been drawn to this kind of thing. I I'm not saying that reality is a simulation. I don't think that. But I do think that there are, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure I can really explain it in a way that makes sense to other people, but to me it's just, I don't know, it's just, it's something that's always interested me. I think that's, that, that pretty well covers it. It's something I've always found to be interesting to think about. And yeah, if if you find it to potentially be scary to think about, then this is not a movie for you. Un unless you're trying to like uh, exposure therapy your way past it. And let's see. yeah, so the best scene or element, I would say, is the reveal of what the answer to the mystery is. I would say it makes it worth watching at least once, and I can only speak for myself and the four people I showed it to. The five of us, not a single one of us, only wanted to watch it once. And let's see. Yeah, so the worst aspect, you will definitely guess, if, if you try at all, you'll definitely guess at least some of what the movie will reveal before the movie gets to the reveal. They, they hint at it too much. And yeah, for, for optimal enjoyment, the first time you watch it, just try to basically pretend that you yourself can't solve it. And yeah. I think if the movie had come out earlier, maybe five or ten years earlier, they could have played it the way they did, but yeah, they just, they didn't realize how good people had gotten at figuring out this kind of thing. And, you know, other sci-fi might have made people more aware of this kind of thing. So, let's see the... Yeah. I try to, in these reviews, go into whether... It is entertaining to watch or not and I would say yes the, the mystery is very engaging and whether it is good or not and I would definitely say it is it's not the best thing ever but it's it's good and it's definitely worth watching at least once I recommend this to fans of science fiction and involved simulation and more so to people who like more murder mysteries and yeah, you know, if you if you don't really get into noir, if if you hate noir, you will hate this movie. Now, my yeah, so I give this seven simulated worlds out of ten. And that is the spoiler free part of the video. So from here on out, spoilers as we start the thoughts section of the video with disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I might keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during the section once I get into the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, let's see. Yeah. Contain spoilers for the movie. If I spoil anything other than the movie, I will hold up an index finger and warn so you can mute and skip ahead. And since we are still dealing with corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. And let's see. Yeah, so content warning and or trigger warning. 
I am going to discuss the idea of someone taking over your body and, you know, you not understanding how that's even happening. You know, even if you were hypothetically okay with it, even if you were like, okay, just ask permission next time, not even knowing why, how it's happening, or why, and if you'll stop, or, you know. And... Yeah, and, and the idea of basically becoming emotionally unstable in response to that. I might criticize the, the violence in this. I just want to say, I don't have problems with violence and gore in general. I think it's one of my favorite horror movies, the movies in general. Also, Cronenberg's The Fly, Videodrome, etc. And I don't have a problem with film sexuality, nudity, disturbing, or upsetting material. Monster is one of my favorite movies and in my opinion the only way sex can be wrong is if consent is violated and or it's cheating and you know I, I it is uncomfortable that Fuller used the simulation of 1937 to have sex with these young women and I think there is um, you know some of them excuse me it's basically hints at that they don't have much of a choice, you know, they're, they're poor, they're trying to get out of their bad situation, and sex work is just one of the only ways they can make money, so that is, yeah, that is really messed up, but the movie knows that, the movie isn't saying that it's, yeah. I might swear at least a little in this video, they, you know, they don't swear that much in the movie itself, from what I recall, I wasn't really trying to notice if they were, but, yeah, I'm, I might swear in quoting the movie so now i got this movie on sale so anything they would have seen in this video is not out of bitterness i was not i feel like the movie wasted my time nobody forced me to watch it or make this video and it's not that i'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it i don't have some personal debt against the people who worked on making it to the best of my ability the negative things i say in this are fair criticisms based on budget when it came out what it was trying to achieve etc Instead of quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here that I loved every line they put in the IMDb in my little quote section, so you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. Some of them I perhaps loved ironically because some of them are very... I mean, that is the thing. Memorable is a bit of a neutral term, isn't it? Are they memorable because it's bad dialogue, or are they memorable because it's good dialogue? Uh, they did a... IMDb did a good job choosing to call it memorable instead of like fun quotes which might also you know if they call it fun quotes and then you find like a monologue from a movie where the the villain is talking about something horrible then it's like well, that's not exactly fun but it is memorable and so let's see So yeah, the rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it's analysis, some of it's MST4K riff tracks and other jokes. And let's see, yeah, so the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. And the, the yeah, the very next section is thoughts I have while watching, chronological order. You can think of it as the running commentary, live tweeting or the like. The second section is, is it, yeah, second after that is thoughts I have before watching. And the final section, I get into stuff I think is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MD, and Wikipedia. And let's see. I think the movie does a good job at not showing us too much of David. You know, he's he's not that interesting. He's very one-note evil bad guy. If they showed him for very long, we would get very bored with him. And it also works that basically all the time we do see him, he's menacing. You know, and it's... Craig Bierko is really, really good. You know, in this and in a... The, uh, 
the long fierce good night, right? I think is what it's called. You know, he's he's really really he's good at playing a psycho, and yeah, the the. The, the, what's the word? Yeah, you know, from the, we, not long after David takes over Doug's body, he shoots Whitney and then threatens Jane and then he dies pretty quickly after. Ultimately, he's not, we don't see him for very much of the movie, but his presence looms large over a lot of the movie. You know, the, the, he he kills Hannon right at the start, and then he kills Tom Jones, not the singer, thankfully, and the the yeah, and then Whitney, and then almost kills Jane, and yeah, so so that whole you know the the uh, what's the word. You know, we're told that there's a brutal killer out there. You know, he killed Hannon brutally. He killed Tom Jones, not the singer, brutally. And, yeah, it, it is legitimately, he is, he is kind of scary. And they do a good job on that. Now, I first watched this, I, I definitely watched it in... 2007. I may have watched it before then. I wasn't writing reviews before 2003. And my written review of this is from 2007. But, you know, since the first time I watched it, it's maybe five times since that I've watched it. You know, since watching it with other people. And then I watched it just before hitting record. That brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. Obviously, if you know anything at all about the movie, you're not surprised that the opening in 1937 is a simulation. But I do still appreciate that they make the effort, you know, like hypothetically, some people might watch the movie and not know that it's a simulation until you see Hannon logging out her. Yeah, there at the start. Let's see. And... I'm sorry, I'm trying to... Decode my note here. What does that mean? Oh, right. The, yeah. Hannon can get a martini in 1999, but it's much less appealing than 1937. And, you know, the you have that brief, you know, he asks, you know, what, what about the olive? And the bartender says, we're out of olives. So later when we see him again, you know, it's, it's you might not think, you know, it's not like some Shakespearean dialogue exchange, but when you see him later, you're like, oh yeah, that guy, the bartender. And let's see. I appreciate the detail that we don't see who the killer is, but we can tell that Hannon recognizes him and is surprised that he's killing Hannon. So we know it's not like gambling debt or something you know then he'd be like no, no no i can get you the money no it's like oh wait what are you doing and it's also not like who are you you know it's not gambling debt it wasn't a stranger so yeah you know it's not hugely difficult to realize that it's doug since there's blood on his sink there's a bloody shirt in the hamper yeah and but but they do a decent job of like at the start of the movie Doug Douglas is confused and you know the the excuse me you 
yeah, you know, his his confusion mirrors our confusion, kind of, yeah. And, yeah, we just meet him, we just barely meet, we have just barely met him, and he's going to have to go to the station for some questions. And, you know, at first, Detective McBain is fairly friendly with Douglas, you know, just, yeah, you know, later on, he's like, Mendoza! But here at first, it's like, you know, stop talking crazy, you know, things are fine. And, yeah, and the guy at the front desk knows where Jane went and hands Doug the keys. Which is, of course, exactly what Jane hoped would happen, since she only has two hours in order, you know, so, so she kind of needs him to find out where she is very quickly. And Doug is very surprised when Jane tells him that Fuller wanted the company shut down. And Jane finds that Doug was listed in the will as taking over the company. I forget, we, yeah, by the end of the movie, we know... Was that, was that David who did that? No, wait, no, it was Hannon. Because he wanted Douglas. Wait, no. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but, but it is said in the movie. And, and McBain, find, you know, points out Doug's alibi doesn't hold up to scrutiny the, the time, yeah. And let's see. And McBain tells Doug that, you know, Fuller called you on the night of the murder. There were script problems from day one. Yeah, and Doug notes, you know, either I did kill Fuller, and I don't remember, or someone's trying to frame me. The one clue is inside that program. I need your help. The camera work does a good job showing Doug's disorientation when he enters the simulation, and, you know, he's immediately inside John's body, in media res and everything. He's not, like, it's, yeah, there's, there's no smooth transition. And let's see. Yeah, and, and uh, let's see. Grierson? It, the Armin Mueller stall in the 1937 simulation feels like he recognizes Doug. And Doug doesn't quite understand why, you know, the, the women he talks to don't like that he asks to talk to Bridget, yeah, Bridget Manoa, which, you know, we, we find out that she's one of the girls that Fuller had sex with for money. And Doug talks to Ashton, and we, you know, we already knew he read the letter. But now he doesn't even hand the letter over to Doug and pretends that he doesn't have it. And it is like, like, like I mentioned in the review, I don't, it's possible they exist. But I don't know any other movie where film noir and realistic simulation of a world is in the same movie. But here it does a good job. You know, it, he is in this 1930, you know. A 1930 setting works well for film noir, you know, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure they were making film noir quite that long, I guess? I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but certainly it wasn't very long after that that they were making film noir. And yeah, you know, he's going from place to place, he's gradually, you know, he's got clues, he's got persons of interest, and gradually he comes closer and closer to a a realization and some of the people he talks to are lying to him some of them are hiding secrets you know so it, it works really well as a film noir mystery 
I actually don't know if if that's a big part of the of the book in the miniseries. That I wasn't quite able to. Find. I I did find that you know apparently in the in crap I forget if it was the book or the miniseries possibly both. Oh right. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I'm obviously also going to be spoiling those. That's not really... I can't really talk about how they line up with this one without spoiling. So, yeah, just be aware. Spoiling the book, spoiling the miniseries. In at least one of those, one of the simulated people commits suicide, and the people who made the simulation don't know why. And so they go and investigate, and they realize that the person realized that they that their world was a simulation. Now, in this movie, no one commits suicide over realizing it, but Ashton, I mean, he was shady before he knew it was a simulation. He was very comfortable with helping this old man have sex with young women for money. But he doesn't seem like he snapped and started killing people before he realized that his world was a simulation. You know, he tells, when, when he attacks Doug, he says, I know that John doesn't know anything. I followed him back to the bank. You know, so he was stalking him, but he didn't kill him because then Doug wouldn't have been able to go into the body of John. So he's, he's a stalker, he's shady, he's a, you know, he sells, he helps men have sex with girls for money, or young women for money. We don't know that they're underage. Thankfully, at least they are of age. But yeah, you know the the one second. Ah, that's silly. There's no indication that he snapped before he realized that his world was just a simulation. You know, so, yeah, he became a murderer once he realized. He, he didn't go suicidal. He went homicidal. And, you know, I, th I think this is basically what they call having a psychotic break, you know. So I really appreciate that that is in there. And I don't think a suicide would have worked as well in this. I, I think starting it with a homicide that we, lay, you know, it turns out that the killing was because the victim knew something they weren't supposed to you know someone is going around trying to clean up because there is a conspiracy so they you know if you if you know film noir everything i'm saying here is is bringing up oh like that's in this this and this there, there, there are tons of film noir that open with a homicide it turns out the person killed knew something but they there's maybe a clue that the killer didn't get rid of so the the per, you know the protagonist can gradually piece together what it ha what had happened and they go around talking to persons of interest you know usually there's no logging into a simulation but it it works you know they they manage to make i i think it's kind of impressive that they manage to make yeah and and others have talked about i i was reluctant to say this in the review itself because it Maybe a spoiler, but the fact that there's these kind of parallel stories, because Ashton is investigating. Excuse me. Ashton is investigating what's going on and working his way towards killing. You know, at first he wants to kill Doug, but then later, you know, when when Doug is gone and it's and it's just John, you know. Actually, I guess we don't know for sure if he. No, yeah, he said, I put Ferguson in the trunk. So he knew that it wasn't Doug. Because didn't Doug introduce himself as Doug? I think so. And and then the... Yeah, yeah, because when John was... was You know, he went over to the to Ashton, and Ashton was like, So, Doug, something, something. And then he was like, My name is John, John Ferguson. Do you know where I am? And, yeah, so the... Uh, what's it called? Let's see. There was something specific that I was getting to. What on earth was it? Let me think. Let's see. The the 
Hmm. Ah. Right, right, yes. Ashton uncovers the, the mystery that he is living in a simulation and works his way towards killing Doug, and he'll settle for killing John. Without, you know, when, when like... When no one is actually logged into the 1937 simulation, you know, when no one is intentionally telling him to do that. So, yeah, you know, in 1999 simulation, you have, excuse me, you have Doug gradually realizing what's going on. In the 1937 simulation, you have Ashton slowly realizing what's going on. And in, in 2024, you have David slowly losing his mind. Although, actually, I guess technically that had started by the time the movie starts. And that's also a thing. If David had started killing people, I mean, I mean, maybe we're supposed to guess that Hannon was the first time he killed someone. Or was he killing in other simulations? I guess that's also possible. Yeah, it, it almost must be something like that. Now, let's see. And I guess we're not supposed to question, like, if if David just wanted, if, if David was interested in killing Jane, why did he not kill her before logging in? Since when Doug works, wakes up in David's body, we see that he and Jane were just a few rooms apart. So it would have been easier for David, but maybe he wanted her to be aware. And maybe he didn't want the hassle of having to kill both in the simulation and in what he considers the real world, but what might also be a simulation. Anyway, yeah, I think the, the parallel stories work really well. The, the fact that a lot of things happen off screen that we just realize happened and yeah by the end of the movie we realize you know it's two different simulations that both in in both you know people are gradually waking up realizing that there's something going on now let's see so yeah Doug struggles to get answers out of Ashton before he starts to come out of the simulation and because he's starting to come out of it when he looks back at the dancing girls you know, it has the I, I guess like a seizure or vertigo kind of vertigo, vertigo kind of effect. You know, it's like he's about to collapse, which works well because the realization is also shocking for him and the audience. I've always liked that in this movie. That's like, basically, it's both. You know, he's he's like, you know, the the his his mind is trying to go back out of the simulation. Because two hours is a lot, you know, as Whitney told him. And he's also, like, you know, I, f I forget exactly what the line is. I think, I think maybe Ashton says, I could introduce you to any of the girls you want to. See anything you like, something like that. And then, you know, Doug turns to look at them and they're dancing. And now it's, like, in slow motion. And, and it's, like, because it's this thing, like, before... I mean, you maybe guessed that the reason the women are so uncomfortable talking to Doug about Bridget is that, you know, it's it's prostitution. But if you hadn't realized that, then it, it hits you the way it hits Doug. And when Doug first looked at the, the young dancing girls, he just, like... At first, he just sees a person of interest. He basically, he barely treats her like a person, I guess. Yeah, yeah. He barely treats her like a person. He goes up and talks to her like, I mean, she could, she could get in real trouble if she talks to him. And the guy also gets angry at her instead of getting angry at Doug. But that's, that's 1937. You know, if, if a woman, if something bad happens, men think it's a woman's fault. And yeah, but the... You know, yeah, when, when he goes over to it, he's not thinking about, like, sexual attraction. And, you know, they're, they're like, they're dancing, and they're, it's like, oh, it's, you know, cute young women. They're, they're like, dancing. They're, they're good at it. You know, they, they're, they're, they're getting the steps right and everything. And 
you know, then when he looks back, it's like, oh no, Fool Hannah was using this for prostitution. You know, it's it's such a great, it's, yeah. And then you know when Ferguson comes out of the bathroom and walks up to Ash, you know, or actually, yeah, at first he's he's leaving, and then Ashton yells. Hey, you didn't finish your drink. And, or, yeah, something like that, you know. And he goes up. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly. But Ashton says to him, didn't finish your drink. And smash cut and Doug is drinking. Sensibly, it's water. So I'm just briefly going to acknowledge the fact that the computer voice does, of course, sound almost exactly like GLaDOS, which isn't this movie's fault. I mean, when they made Portal, they decided to make that sound like the typical neutral computer voice, and that was also the choice they made for this movie, so, you know, but this is the first time I rewatched this movie since I played the two Portal games, and it is kind of funny, like, I just, you know, the, just, yeah, it's, it's, I, I can't really listen to that voice and not think GLaDOS, you know, the, just, the, yeah, you know, the, the simulation, the, the voice says something like, Simulation completed. Now you will be baked, and then there will be cake. Yeah, that's sorry. That's not a very good Galatos impersonation. I used to have it pretty well down, but it's been several years since I last played them. Tom Jones, you know, like the singer, shows up and tries to blackmail Doug and attacks him, and then Doug attacks the guy back and is shocked at what he just did. And, you know, you, you have one of the cheesy lines. You're dangerous, man. I'll see you on America's Most Wanted. And if, you, if you're paying attention, if you're trying to solve the puzzle, you probably just realized, you know, someone is, is you know, 1999 is also a, ah, what's it called? 1999 is also a simulation, and someone from outside the simulation is logging in, using Doug's body to kill, and then logging back out, and leaving him with the problem. And, yeah, because we've just seen that when Doug takes over John Ferguson, you know, he's also, you know, and, and with Fuller, it also appears that, actually, no, wait, were we told? I guess technically we haven't been told yet that... No, no, but, you know, you see that John Ferguson, you know, you, we see the audience sees, Doug doesn't, but the audience sees Ferguson when Doug isn't in control of his body, when he's leaving this place, you know, and Ashton says he didn't finish his drink and this whole thing. So we know, the audience knows that, you know, sometimes a simulation... Yeah, they call them units, don't they? One of the sim units, you know, they realize that there's uh, that something happened while they were, you know, blacked out or something. And we already know that at the start of the movie, when, you know, because, yeah, because McBain already told Doug and us, he called, you know, Hannon called him and that there was a, you know, Doug had, Doug's plane had landed by the time he, he killed Hannon. I guess that's why, like, hypothetically, he couldn't have killed him even sooner. Yeah, David was waiting for Doug to land the plane and deplane before, yeah. And Jane tries to convince Doug to abandon the simulation. And Jane and Doug dance. By this point, the movie is 30% people dancing. I'm not complaining, I'm just saying. And Tom Jones, you know, like the singer, but thankfully not the singer, has been brutally killed. And McBain is being a bit more intense with Doug now. Jane gives Doug an alibi. And, yeah, Doug is, he's not certain that it wasn't him who killed Tom. So he enters the simulation again, and he doesn't engage the timer. You know, I, I get the, yeah, I, never mind, I'll get to that soon. So, yeah, Doug goes back into the simulation during a Lindy Hop contest. 
Okay, by now the movie is 40% people dancing. And Doug walks off even though his dance partner is clearly upset at it. At this point, he's showing almost as little regard for the people in 1937 simulation as the as as Hannon Fuller did and as 2020 as and as David does for you know for people in the 1990 simulation. And yeah, Doug Doug talks to 1937 Armin Mueller Stahl. I saw at least one person confused by how Whitney. Ashton takes over Whitney's body. Excuse me. Now, the. Yeah. Whitney says that if you stay for more than two hours, you know, you'll, you'll still be the person from the simulation. And earlier he said that your body holds onto the consciousness. So when Whitney dies, the simulation Ashton wakes up in Whitney's body. I don't know. I, personally, I don't think it needs more explaining or setup than that. It's, yeah. Poor Whitney. He kind of gets screwed. We don't even know if there is one of him in 2024. Poor guy did absolutely nothing wrong. He's, he's, nice, he's helpful, he tries to keep Doug from screwing, you know, from, from using the, the simulation for too long, and they just get killed twice, although it's only one of the times that he himself feels it, excuse me, the other time Ashton feels it, and then, yeah, I mean, we don't even know if he's there at the end in 2024. I mean, it's nice that Hannon is there, but what about Whitney? I, it's, poor guy. Anyway, and that actually, yeah, Whitney tells Doug and us that two hours is too long. It's, it's not safe, but that was how long Hannon was using it for. So we know that he was taking advantage of that as well. In addition to the, the girl, I do find it a little uncomfortable that when, um, what's his name? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the 1937 Armin Mueller stall. When he walks and he's wearing the, the suit, one of the, the young women walks up to him and says, I'll be ready for you in a minute, honey bear. That's kind of creepy. I, I, I guess maybe the idea is supposed to be that she is worried that if she doesn't do that, he won't pay her, maybe. I really hope that they're not trying to say that, like... I mean, again, I think they are supposed to be of age. I'm not 100% certain. I really hope. Obviously, if they're not, it's even more messed up. But, like, I don't know. If she's, like, 19 and she walks up to... It's not about the age, but it's the fact that... There's no, it's it's not, it's not age, it's not appearance, but the fact that it is sex for money, and especially at a time when that was seen as just completely unacceptable, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I hope that the movie isn't saying that she actually secretly is into it because I can't really, at at that point, the the movie must be judging her for that choice. And it's especially bad because she's she's got like two seconds of screen time and she spends all of that cozying up to this guy. And it's especially creepy because he doesn't even know her because it's the other Armin Mueller stall. Anyway. And yeah, he insists to, to John that let's see, he hasn't been to this place before. He hasn't met the girls before. Wait. Oh, yes. Or wait, is it that he has? Yeah, I think that, yeah. You know, eventually, Doug manages to convince him. And then he's like, yeah, I recognize. And he says, I gave the note to, to the bartender, you know, and Ashton can tell 
that his lie is being revealed. Vincent D'Onofrio does really excellent acting. The, the close-ups they give him in this movie are very strong. Like, he, he, like, as Ashton, he is legitimately very off-putting. And, you know, at the same time, this guy can, can, some of his performances, he's very appealing. Honestly, I, I like him as, like, his, Whitney, I, I'd hang out with Whitney. He seems, he seems really cool. You know, in, in the, I mean, not, not in the, like, smooth and suave kind of way, but, like, I bet he knows some really fun, you know, some, some movies that, you know, he's a nerd, I'm a nerd. You know, we'd probably like some of the same movies. And it is legitimately tense and suspenseful as Doug walks down to catch up with Ashton. And this whole thing, you know, Ashton wants, you know, I mean, and I, I like that it is explicitly like Ashton spells out, why are you doing this? You know, he's not saying, he, it's not that Ashton was always going to try to kill Doug. No, it's that he found out that his world isn't real. And it he's, he snapped, basically. And, you know, and, and it's such a good, like, Doug wants to read the letter, but Ashton won't give it to him. And we see, like, the letter ends up in the water. And, you know, he's not going to be able to read it, even if he logged back in. But he, you know, Ashton tells him what's in the letter while talking about how scared he was when he realized the truth. So it's, it's a good kind of, it's, it's a nice way to sort of, it honestly would be kind of boring if it just culminated in him finding a letter and sitting down and reading it. The, the shock comes from the realization of the truth. And that isn't coming up just yet. It's, it's, it's coming up fairly soon. But, you know, yeah, at, at first, the, the, let's see, you know, yeah, the, the, so the shocking thing about the scene is that Ashton is trying to kill him, and, you know, we know that it's not, you know, if he dies in the simulation, then his body wakes up with the other, with the, with the sim unit in his mind. And, yeah, and, and Whitney straight up says, why would you put us through this? Why are you fucking with our minds? And Doug legitimately, you know, didn't, hadn't thought about what it does to people in the simulation. And Doug even, like, ah, what's it called? Ah, uh, one second. Doug, right, when, yeah, when, when Ashton is telling him about the contents of the letter, Doug is like, why would Hannon tell me that 1937 is a simulation? I know that. You know, he doesn't stop and think, you know, he, he realizes a little later, but he's not like, wait a second. It can't be about the 1937 simulation because I already know that I helped him make it. Of course, you know, and it can't have shocked Hannah to realize that 1937 was a was a simulation. But he's still like his 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 thought process is still so narrow. He he you know he's thinking okay, there's 1999, which are us humans, and then there's 1937, which is a simulation. Why is why would one human be shocked that 1937 is a solution is a simulation, and why did he think it was important for me to know that it was a simulation? I know it's a simulation without thinking. Wait, if 1937 is a simulation, and someone from 1990 is freaked out about a simulation, maybe 1999 is the simula is also a simulation. You know. I f I forget if. There isn't really any specific thing, right? It just kind of dawned on him, and I don't think there was a specific thing that made him realize that it was a simulation, which I think maybe also bothered some people for the mystery, but 
I think it is like after a while that would occur to you. You know, when when you've been doing something for a while, you start to think about it more abstractly. That just you know that that yeah if anyway. And Doug realizes he's been there for more than two hours and is confused why he's still there. And, yeah, I, I saw at least one person criticize that aspect as well. Without Whitney, he doesn't know enough about how to start the machine to set the timer. He hasn't done it before by himself. And he's worried that Whitney will say no, and also that so much time will pass that he may not be able to go in there. Like... If he gets arrested again and Jane doesn't show up to give him an alibi, who knows when he'll be able to go back. Let's see. And, you know, people that he knows are dying one by one. He has to... It, it's literally life or death. You know, so... Yeah. And... And since Ashton is drowning Doug, when Doug wakes up, he starts of trying to strangle Whitney, and it's it's a good and and I really like. For several seconds there, Whitney is legitimately afraid of Doug, you know, like he like Doug put, puts his hand, hands around, and and he's like, okay, okay, you're you're Douglas something, you know, you're not John Ferguson. It's okay. Are you are you awake? You know, and he's like, oh, okay, okay, I'm awake. And Whitney steps several steps away, and he's like, he's a little worried. He's like, don't, don't come too close to me, okay? And it, yeah, I, I, that worked, honestly. It, it's legitimately like, you know, he's he is that scared because, excuse me, you know, they've known each other for at least six years, and he's never attacked him before. I also do like the line about, you know, so what is what does Ashton look like? He's got better hair than you do. And... Yeah, and now that Doug has woken up, he's insisting to Whitney they have to shut it down. These people in the simulation are real. And, you know, Whitney's like, we spent, it's six years of our lives we spent on this. The lady vanishes. Cute. That's a movie title. I'm not... Ex I hope I don't sound pretentious. I don't expect most people to know that. That's like a it's it's like a forties noir movie or something. I I only know of it because I had I hadn't even remembered how, but you know, I saw that, that the Lady Vanishes Vanishes was on the list of connections on IMDb for this movie as that this movie references the Lady Vanished Vanishes. And I didn't remember how, but the moment that McBain said it, I was like, Oh that's how it yeah. You know, if you, if you don't know that, I, yeah, then you're not going to know, of course. If you don't know the movie or know that it's being referenced at some point, and, you know, McBain confronts Doug, telling him that there is no Jane Fula. And Doug pays the driver to take him to Jane. And, you know, she needed a driver to get all the way since, you know, yeah, between... The, the hotel and where Natasha Molinaro stays, and Natasha Molinaro can't, you know, yeah, she can't afford a driver, and, you know, yeah, 2024 Jane is careful enough to make sure Natasha, you know, to get Natasha from A to B. You know, there's, of course, still the amnesia spots, but as far as I can tell, she's careful that Jane, that Natasha doesn't wake up in the hotel room, for example. Because that would kind of spoil things if, you know, if she walks to the driver and says the wrong name, then that's going to blow it for, you know, then, then 2024 Jane can't use that driver again. I mean, seeing that Natasha doesn't recognize Doug basically does tell the audience that 1999 must also be a simulation. And the movie is only an hour and five minutes in. There's almost half an hour le of movie left, even though the major twist has, you know, maybe it hasn't been revealed, but the audience has enough information to piece it together. Yeah, and Doug pieces it together very soon after. 
Yeah, actually, yeah, he does piece it together from that. So he does what the letter said, driving through blockades and such. And and McBain and the cop talk about Natasha slash Jane. Excuse me. And and Jane takes over Natasha's body again and immediately gets rid of the gum. And I, I agree that the dialogue is kind of ridiculous, but I do kind of like, you know, where are you? You could call it the end of the world. And, and we see, and I saw someone say in their review, they shouldn't have put the 3D grid on the cover. And he points out, as I would point out, when you first watch the movie, you don't know that that's what you're looking at. But I am going to agree with him. Yeah, I agree with him on everything he said about that, including that... Okay, now I forget which I said, so I'll just say both. They shouldn't have put it on the, the cover, the DVD cover and the poster, but the first time you watch the movie, you don't realize that that's what you're seeing. But you shouldn't have the visual of the grid before you watch the movie. But it is like it's a it's a it's an image that it grabs your attention, you know. So yeah. And let's see. Yeah, and Jane tells Doug there are thousands of simulations. And Jane tells Doug about David. I mean, at least part of the reason for the love story, which again, like I said in the earlier, like I said in the review, if you're gonna have like a, a love love story or something like that in the movie, I we I, I want it to be in service of something. I don't. That's not. I understand some people don't need it, don't don't want that or, yeah, and that's fine. But without the love story, you know, here. It is this thing of, you know, the love story helps convey that even these sim, sim units are capable of something as human as love. You can't really create something that is quite like love. I mean, you can fake it, but the movie is saying that their love is real. You know, Doug knows that, even though, you know, he's obviously having an existential crisis, a, a minor one. I, I guess that's, that's, the, that's what it's supposed to be. The reason Doug doesn't freak out like Ashton does is because Doug loves Jane. But then what about McBain, though? I I, I feel like near the end, they kind of just wanted to get through the last bit, and that's why both Doug and McBain handled the truth so much better than Ashton did. Yeah. Anyway, the, the, let's see. Yeah, you know, the, the Doug deep down does know. That was a lot of alliteration. Deep down does, deep down does Doug? Doug does deep down know their love is real. And Jane knows their love is real. And if you remove the love story, you would certainly have to replace it with something else. And I do think love is probably the most you you really can't like i know there are some video games that do an incredible job of making the player really empathize with the love in the game and, and movies as well but you can't really like there, there are some people who fake love for example to to get sex but you can't you know and and you know I've, I know that there are at least some, I, I had, when I took biology, my biology textbook, I don't know if it was someone who was just broken up with or something, but it sounded like, it sounded kind of bitter. It said that love is in actuality nothing except some chemical reactions. You know, and and this, and I realize that obviously that's why we, that's part of why it feels like such a strong emotion. But it's ridiculous to just say, you know, it's yeah. I I think it it said, and again, 
you know, it is partially true. The reason that love feels so strong is because the, the, you know, the brain is sending a bunch of chemicals and hormones to, to the body to convey you have just met someone that you should procreate with. Procreate with them post haste so that you don't miss your opportunity, which is also why some people, when they are, when they really badly want sex, they can respond very negatively, very harshly to being, okay, I, I don't like the, the phrase being denied sex, but if they can't have sex, they will, and, and it is basically like that some part, like the, the lizard brain is basically the same, but if you don't have sex with that person, you might not re reproduce and recreate, you know, you, you might not reproduce, and if you don't reproduce, you're going to die, and when you die, okay, you're going to die anyway, because we all die. And, and it's like going through this complete existential crisis also. And it's like, if you don't reproduce, your line dies out. And, you know, that feels really strong. But you can't chalk it all up to that. And now, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm sounding like a complete, like a, just complete, uh, what's the word? There's like a harsh word for optimist. Okay, let's just go with optimist. There is such a thing as love that exists in, you know, from, from some, you know, uh, outside of sex. And, you know, one of the things is, for example, love between family members, which I am aware that some, some family members have sex with each other, but yeah. And, yeah, I'm not going to discuss incest further. It's, it's not a good idea. Let's just, I'm, I'm just going to, which hopefully you already knew that. But most people don't have sex with their family members, but there is still a love there. So love isn't just about that your brain is preparing you for sex. You know, I know that some people like to try to remove all the motion from it because they don't like that love can control them. They don't like losing any control like that. And yeah, it, it everyone at some point in their lives has an experience where they wish that love didn't have as much control over them as it does. And I, you know, I realize some people unfortunately go through a lot of their life, maybe it's all of their life without love. In that case, it's the fact that their life is loveless. That's what's controlling them. You know, that, that has more control over them than they wish it, it did. And yeah, so the, the, And, and the, the thing with, you know, the reason that the, the love story, that the, the love in the movie, <clears throat> the love in the movie is sexual love is because that's something that's easy to quickly convey to an audience. And, yeah, you know, the, the and I mean, at the end of the, yeah, it is maybe also, the most immediate, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, Tim Minchin calls, you know, s says that, that love doesn't happen at first sight, it creeps up on you. And this movie isn't about that creepy uppy kind of love, it is about love at first sight. And it does play with this romantic notion that some people really love that if, you know, maybe you were together in a previous life. Maybe that's why. I mean, it was meant to be. And that is something that this movie, yeah, excuse me, basically, the fact that Jane in 2024 fell in love with Doug, that does mean they were meant to be because it's not, you know, it's, I mean, it's one thing that he looks like David, but the, the, actually, 
was he, was David's personality a lot like Doug's? And that's why. And anyway, you know, and and I know some people feel that that means the love is less compelling. I'm not gonna get into that, but yeah, you know, it plays with that sort of thing, and. Yeah, it's just, it, it wouldn't be the same if it tried to, to say, oh, but you're related, you've been related. The, the love between family members is in part something that comes from and is strengthened by mutual experiences, you know, that, which, which is also something that works for a couple staying together in the long term where it's not just about sex, you know, and so, so yeah, you know. I, I don't know that they could really have done it, have had it be about love if it wasn't about sexual love. And I think they could have used something instead of the love story, but it being a love story, you know, it is something like the, the moment that it's, you know, this is also something that the, the Schwarzenegger movie, The Sixth Day, deals with. If something, if someone, you know, in that movie it's a clone, in this movie it's a simulated person. If they didn't come about in the normal way, how can I be sure that they're really human? And one of the most, yeah, love is one of the, you know, okay, you know, technically animals love as well, but it makes you alive. It means you're real. It means you're not just... A, you know, a bunch of zeros and ones. It means you're not just, you know, a slab of meat and, you know, ma made to move by a, a, a brain. No, you are actually alive. There's something more there. And, yeah, I, I, I don't personally love that it's a love story. But I'm not sure. I, th I think they basically had to do it. I don't think they could have really done it with anything other than a love story. Because it's not, you know, it's not enough to say, oh, but you're really smart. You know, that computers are smart. That doesn't, you know, you don't want to marry a computer just because it's smart. Well, some people do, I guess. I'm not sure that we ever find out exactly why Whitney went into the simulation. I figured that he's scared that he'll never get to try it. If Doug really does shut it down. Again, like six years. And he's one of the people most excited about it. You see that when he's talking to McBain. And... And yeah, Whitney almost reveals the gun to the cop. I really like how you know he the he's like ah oh, I didn't I mean I left my wallet at home. Why don't you check the glove box? Oh right you know and he opens it and the you know the revolver is lying right there and he I, I think he sort of touches it but he's careful not to pull it out and he's like ah oh, that's you know and then the cop's like oh you need more light says, ah no you know what I am one hundred percent. I, I'm not going to need more light for the rest of my life. Thank you, officer. I appreciate you offering. And, you know, just as the cab is leaving, then Ferguson starts, like, making noise in the, in the, uh, what's it called? Ah. Yeah, you know, the, the back, the back of the car. I could imagine some people might find it hard to believe that Whitney dies from being run over, like, immediately like that. If I recall, in 1937, they had less restrictions on how fast cars were. So, certainly, like, in the very early days of cars, they had very little restriction on how fast to drive. Like, basically, people didn't really, you know, the people who could have made it happen didn't stop to think, wait, people, like... Before the the car, it was you you could run or you could travel, to, you know may, you could ride on a horse or you could have a carriage, you know ah, horse drawn carriage. If a horse sees a person running, the horse is gonna try to avoid running into them. But a car can move faster, and suddenly you have to rely on the person who 
isn't like we, we don't like come out of the womb ready to you know ready to drive a car there's a reason you have to get a license before you can drive a car and, like think of all the things that you're that, that human beings are allowed to do without getting a license you know but a car we know that's dangerous and that's something you have to active you, you have to make sure you learn it and then you have to maintain that skill set and yeah back then it you know a lot of people did get killed in car accidents because drivers didn't realize okay so if i'm going this fast and the guy's way over there i actually only have like a second to slow down so they would slow down too too late and accidentally run into the person and thankfully eventually we got laws about how fast you are allowed to drive and it's possible but that by 1937 it was no longer as much of a thing but i think Plus, it's at night, it's raining, he, and he did kind of step into the road, which is also like, why is the cop, like, saying, step back, and, dude, he's gonna, he's gonna walk right into the road if he steps back, you know, so, anyway, I, I guess the cop kind of panicked. It was kind of a, a extreme situation for him as well, to be fair. And Ashton doesn't know how to open the glass doors. So, you know, he, he eventually realizes, oh, the, the, you know, I just got to move the, the, ah, what's it called? The, the card over the thing. And the, and the guard calls, uh, you know, Doug. And he's like, you better come take a look at this boss. It's like, I, I don't, we don't even, I'm not sure we do hear the conversation, but he's like, I think. I think Whitney might need a little help. He's, he's, I mean, I guess he figures that maybe he's drunk or something or, yeah. And it, it is like, I really love Ashley does, Ashton does do it the way you would expect. Like, he's used to doors opening when, like, you know, he, he tries to pull the door open. He doesn't understand an electronic lock. He's like, there's no key. I can't. I clearly can see that there is no room where I could put a key, so clearly the door can't be locked. So I don't understand why I can't pull it open. And I think it actually happens by accident. He, like, accidentally swipes the card, and then you realize, oh, hey, that's how that works. You know, it's because it's, he's not stupid. He's just, you know, 62 years out of touch with technology, but... He's, you know, he's clearly not stupid. He, he, he managed to realize that Douglas has no idea, what, sorry, John has no idea what's going on. That, that's Douglas and not John, so. And he's laughing at seeing 1990s, 1999 TVs and uh, clips and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great kind of, he's basically, he's, he, he kind of can't anymore. You know, it's it's not like oh, that's a really funny show. It's like, what is what is going on? Why? Where am I? What is, you know, his his idea of what reality is has just been rewritten. You know, like it's just he he can't. He 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 may have known for for some hours now that there is more than one reality, and his reality is a simulation. But he didn't expect the real reality to look this different. And to and for him to just wake up and you know he even says, I you know I was last thing I know I was stuffing John in the trunk or Ferguson I think he calls him in the trunk. And you know Doug comes in and realizes it's Ashton not Whitney and Vincent D'Onofrio is really good at playing intimidating. And I guess he got the gun from the guard that called Doug, cause. Yeah, it's not, it's not a huge, it's, it's a build, it's a, it's a highly secure building, there are people with guns, and, and Ashton is very tenacious, I, it's not a problem that we don't see exactly where it comes from, and the, let's see, he did it, the absolute madman. And Doug tells Ashton 1999 is also a simulation. And it is kind of, you know, 
the, you know, that it says, then, then why didn't they kill you? Maybe they will. And yeah, an hour and 23 minutes. So, so yeah. And, and we get our first real look at David. So he gets less than 10 minutes of screen time, actually. Because he's dead before the ending, which had 33 minutes. Yeah, so I do agree that the ending with, like, when, when Ashton and David are both in 1999 in, in the building, it's kind of obvious that David is going to kill Ashton. But I'm not sure the point is that we're not sure who's going to win. It's that, you know, we're, we're seeing Ashton. We, we don't even necessarily think that much about it, but there is a pretty good amount of character development and character moments for Ashton over the course of the film. So... It's, we're not necessarily sad that uh, that David kills Ashton, but it is it it is a real character death. I mean, I think I know more about Ashton than I know about Whitney, and I think Ashton might get a little bit more screen time at least. And certainly, we see him in very extreme situations, which you know the most extreme we see Whitney in is when he's shocked that Ferguson was in the trunk, which is not as dramatic as. Ashton's so so yeah the it's not that we're sad that Ashton dies but he is a character we've known him for a long time we've seen him go through really you know extreme experiences it and and he is the kind of person that David would kill David doesn't want people in doesn't want sim units realizing that their world is a simulation so it actually kind of saves David some trouble that Whitney gets run over and David sorry Ashton ends up in 1999 then David doesn't have to use Doug to use Ferguson to kill Ashton yeah but yeah, I it's it, I I agree that the moment that we see David take over Doug, and we know that, you know, once once Doug is like standing at the at the grid there, we're like, any minute now, David's gonna take over again, cause that's you know exact that's exactly what he's you know he's killed Gil Hannon who found out that that 1999 was a simulation. He killed Tom Jones, not the singer, because he found out that that Doug killed Hannon, and yeah, he's gonna kill, you know, yeah, he's killing Ashton, who knew his world was a simulation, and he's gonna kill Jane just because he is jealous, and yeah, but the, the yeah, the, the thing... Let's see. It you know yeah we're not we're not necessarily sad that we that Ashton dies, but we are it it is like a, an you know he's he's a fairly major character and he dies and it it's the kind of thing where it, yeah for for one thing it's also. It's not the first time David kills, it's not the first time David kills using Doug's body, but it is the first time that David kills using Doug's body that we are, that we see with our own eyes. You know, it kind of hammers home, this is David, this is not Doug anymore. And, yeah, you know, I mean, I mean if, if, you, if you say that we don't need to see that, well, then I guess we also don't need to see... Doug be confused when, excuse me, when he comes, when, when he's suddenly in John's body at the bank, or, excuse me, when he's suddenly at the Lindy Hop competition, you know. And so at first, it looks like Jane talked to the police, and then just like went back to sleep, but really, she's, you know, it's, 
I think the police will gener generally tell you, okay, stay, stay where you are, we're sending a unit. And that's basically what they told her, and it's also, it's a logical thing for her to do. Like, hypothetically, let's say she left bed and tried to, yeah, let, let's hypothetically say that she went to the police station. Is David really going to follow her there, risking his own death? The moment that he logs in, he's risking his own death. So, you know, she wants to lower his guard, and yeah. I already said in the review that some of the actors have to play multiple personalities. I mean, we see three for Craig Bierko and Armin Mueller's tall, and they both do incredible. We don't really for Jane. No, because Jane is from 2024, and Natasha's from 1999. And she doesn't have a sim unit in 1937. Yeah, it is only Craig Bierko and Armin Mueller Stahl that we see in all three. And David chasing Jane here at the end, it's decent, you know, tense. Yeah, decent as like a tense ending to the movie. It is kind of cliched, and I'm not sure I would say it really feels that satisfying of a way to end this particular movie. I mean, it basically feels like the last scene of a slasher movie. But then, you know, we've known that there was a killer loose from the very start of the film. You know, we, we see Fuller killed. So, you know, it is, this is a logical conclusion. It, yeah, it is a logical conclusion that the very last thing in the movie is that killer be stopped. And, yeah. And it is, like, a lot of noir movies end with the death of a major character. And, yeah. And it, it is especially kind of silly. That, like, I think it's supposed to be that she's so afraid. But I guess maybe she's playing it up to convince David. But, like, right after, like, she, like, locks the glass door on him. And then she walks a few steps. And then she kind of stops for, for just like a second or two, and he shoots the glass, and then she keeps running. I mean, yeah, I, I the only thing I can figure is that we're supposed to take it as Jane is getting him to lower his guard. Because if he, for a second, thinks that she's trying to trick him, I mean, hypothetically, if he goes in the completely different direction... I, I mean, we don't know if there's any way to leave the simulation. So presumably he has almost two hours left. So leave the simulation without waiting for the hours to, to pass. So presumably he has almost two hours left because it doesn't take him long to get to Jane. But yeah, I, th I think that is the, you know, and it is, it, it does feel like it, almost becomes a different movie for a few minutes there, and yeah, I, I can understand people who feel that, you know, after all this murder mystery noir stuff, and then it comes down to a, a guy chasing a woman, and he's got a gun, and he's going to try to shoot her, you know, it's, yeah, and yeah, the, you know, we, we see that Jane was waiting for McBain to get there, And, let's see, yeah, she wanted David to lower his guard so that McBain could, yeah, yeah, could go, come close enough to, to both of them that he could successfully kill David without David killing Jane. Let's see. And, yeah, you know, Ashton basically loses his mind. And I guess the reason that 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 Doug doesn't is because Jane is there to talk him through it and points out their love is real. But yeah, you know, McBain just says, leave us alone down here. But then I guess technically, maybe he doesn't know for sure that it's a simulation that he's living. He might, you know... He might not have realized that, and so he's just contempt, cont 
not contempt. He's full of content with knowing that there's something going on. He can't explain it. I guess that kind of works. Let's see. I mean, I'm not sure that Doug really earned a happy ending. You know, like... Yeah, so spoilers for The Matrix. I would say that Neo earned his happy ending. He goes through a lot of pain and trauma, and he trains really hard. And he, I mean, he is willing to sacrifice his own life to get Morpheus back. I, I, you know, you can, I'm not saying The Matrix is perfect, but I do think that Neo earned his ending. And I don't know that I think Doug earned a happy ending in this movie. And then you also have that the first Matrix movie, you know, ignoring the sequels briefly, the first Matrix movie ends on a note of humanity will be set free. The simulation will be stopped. In this movie, won't they just keep the simulations going? You know, there's not really, you know, she said that there were thousands, but this was the only one that built a simulation of their own. Well, the other ones are still unethical. And we're not going to shut them down, you know. It just it doesn't completely take the 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 it doesn't accept the consequences of what it set up. Anyway, no more spoilers for the Matrix for the time being. And I'm I'm not sure that Doug would be happy in the long run, knowing that almost his entire life has been a simulation. I mean, that's that's another thing that like. <clears throat> We're not really told. We're told that they worked six years on 1937, but they have characters in 1937 that are significantly older. So I guess they have implanted memories. That works. That's not a problem. But does that mean that Doug has only been, has only existed for a few years? I guess less than six years, since they must have gotten a lot better at making simulations in the future. Okay, I'm sorry. That gets creepy. Does that mean that Jane is in love with someone who's basically only been alive for a few years? I mean, okay, he has the maturity, the emotional maturity of a of a man, of a of a grown grown person, but Yeah, that's that's a little bit Yeah, they ultimately they didn't really take the the consequences of the ethical issue they set up. Anyway, I mean, noir movies don't tend to have happy endings. I don't know. I guess maybe that can that counts as expectation subversion because this ending is definitely played as being happy. The alternate ending is a bit darker, but yeah, 